I'm um, assistant professor at the Academy of Film at the School of Communication and Film, Hong Kong Baptist University. And uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker in this panel, Pete Millwood, a postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows in the Humanities at the University of Hong Kong, who researches the history of the Chinese world's international and transnational relations, particularly with the United States. Pete, stage is yours. Thank you. Share my screen. Share the PowerPoint here. Yes. Thanks, Ms. Air, and thanks to all the organizers um, for their work putting this exciting conference together. I'm particularly excited to be presenting somewhere other than my office or my home study with, with somewhat of an in person audience as well as um, those joining online. So, I've been very interested by the discussions we've already had about Cold War narratives and the many different ways that we can think about narratives uh, surrounding the Cold War and narrating the Cold War. My paper today is an attempt to challenge and perhaps rethink Cold War narratives, Cold War inflected narratives about the origins of the contemporary US-China relationship and of the rapprochement of the 1970s between China and the United States. Now, I know that in the previous uh, panel, there was some, uh, some comments about going beyond that bilateral relationship, but for at least the next 15 or so minutes, and that's what I will be, I'll be speaking about, although I agree that uh, the broadening our discussion of, of a contemporary US-China Cold War should go beyond just the US and China. So I recently completed my first book, which has the title, which has this title, Improbable Diplomats, How Ping Pong Players, Musicians and Scientists Remade US-China Relations. And it looks at the relationship between Chinese and American societies in the first decade of the renewed relationship uh, between the two sides between 1969 and 1978. And much of the existing historiography on Sino-American relations in the 1970s has focused on the highest level of diplomacy conducted between the top leadership of the two countries, often during summit trips, such as Richard Nixon's famous 1972 trip to China. But my book seeks to show that if we take a, a different focus and look at relations below the high diplomatic summit level, we can reveal other under-examined histories and narratives. Moreover, it seeks to perhaps undermine some of the frequently remembered and recited aspects of the rapprochement, what we might go as far as saying are the myths of the origins of the modern Sino-American relationship. And that's, that, that second point is what I'll be speaking about today. So I'll start my analysis with the received wisdom that I quote in my title, that only Nixon could go to China. This is a, a myth, if we accept that term, a myth that was promoted by Nixon and the Nixon administration itself. Nixon claimed that his unimpeachable anti-communist domestic credibility had allowed him, as a staunch Republican, to visit China, not in an act of ideological capitulation to communism, but instead as a stratagem involved, a stratagem that took uh, a, a part of a hard-nosed self-serving realist foreign policy. One of the ways we might question this narrative is to consider whether Nixon's visit to China was truly as hard-nosed as the president claimed. In fact, even if Nixon hardly became a convert to communism, his visit contained much sentiment and even a sense of redemption in the wake of the failure of Vietnam. It was also, I think, then an emotional account encounter. But I won't go into detail on that more speculative point in this presentation. Instead, I want to show that the necessary implication of Nixon's claim that no other American leader could go to China was false. In fact, by the time that Nixon entered office in 1969, there was something like an emerging consensus among centrist American elites that two decades of attempting to contain and isolate China had to end and give way to a new policy. One China watcher, the Shanghai-born Columbia political scientist, A. Doak Barnett, advocated a new policy in the late 1960s, namely 
containment without isolation. That is, that while the United States should continue to recognize that the People's Republic of China posed a threat to other American interests in Asia and thus had to be, quote, contained, Washington should also come to terms with the reality of the PRC and begin some level of engagement with Beijing. One of the venues in which Barnett made this argument was in Senate hearings in 1966 held by the Foreign Relations Committee Chair, William Fulbright. So this was not sort of some kind of small minority discourse. Indeed, Barnett's formulation came to be influential through the 1960s and was referenced, albeit without Barnett's name, in Nixon's own famous 1967 foreign affairs article, Asia After Vietnam, that is often cited as evidence of the president's long-term plan to change China policy. Barnett enjoyed some influence with the predecessor of the Nixon government, Lyndon Johnson's Democratic administration. As studied by the historian Michael Lumbers, Barnett and influential academics counseled Johnson to attempt to open a dialogue with Beijing. And the president was not unconvinced by their arguments. And throughout Johnson's presidency, he attempted to catch Chinese leaders' attention by unilaterally lifting restrictions on contact and by proposing to allow American doctors and public health scientists to travel to China on what he described as compassionate grounds. And during his presidency, Johnson approved travel to China for more than 300 Americans, in fact, in the, 19, in the late 1960s. Only a tiny fraction of these individuals, in fact, traveled to China, however, as the vast majority were refused entry by Beijing. And I think this is indicative of what really prevented Johnson from achieving anything like Nixon's later breakthrough. It was not that Johnson was so much more afraid of seeming soft on Chinese communism. Instead, practically speaking, it was that the years before Nixon's entry to office were those in which China underwent a tumultuous, xenophobic and introspective period, the radical phase of the Cultural Revolution. This Chinese context effectively scuppered any chance of Johnson's efforts to begin a dialogue with leaders in Beijing. Instead, many of the proposals made within the State Department and the US government during his administration were kept on ice to be reactivated during Nixon's time in office. Ideas for pursuing a new policy of containment without isolation were not only discussed within government, however, for example, just two months after Nixon entered office in January 1969, a major public national convocation on US-China policy was held in New York. The event attracted 2,500 attendees and 200 journalists and was organized by a non-governmental organization that Barnett had previously chaired, the National Committee on US-China Relations. The convocation's audience heard from prominent voices like the doyen of Chinese history in the United States, John K. Fairbank, and the dinner address was given by the Democratic Senator, Ted Kennedy. A range of opinions were aired in the, at the convocation, but Kennedy and many of the other speakers advocated for beginning travel and trade between the United States and China as a means to begin a more fundamental transformation in the relationship between the two countries and governments. Months later, Barnett, Fairbank, and other leading figures from the National Committee on US-China Relations spent a whole day at the White House in hours of meetings with Henry Kissinger and then an hour with President Nixon himself. And many of the proposals they made in those meetings were enacted by the US government the following year. These meetings were held at the same time as internal US government studies were putting forward many of the same arguments as those made by Barnett at the National Convocation. My argument then is not that Barnett, Kennedy, or the National Committee on US-China Relations deserve sole credit for the in initiatives that Nixon would take in 1969 through 1971 that would successfully begin rapprochement. Instead, I am attempting to give you a sense of how widely shared the belief that the United States should and could begin engagement with China was in 1969. 
If Nixon deserves credit for his China initiative, I think it should be for the execution and not for the conception of the opening. Attempting such an opening was by 1969, I think, a consensus opinion. Still, this is not to take all credit from Nixon or Kissinger for that execution. Their careful and insistent signaling and effective back channel diplomacy between 1969 and 1971 helped secure an invitation for first Kissinger and then Nixon to visit China, two visits that quickly transformed the relationship between the two governments. That said, it was contingent that it was ultimately Kissinger and Nixon who made the first historic visits by US politicians to the PRC. Of course, the first notable visit to China of Americans in 1971 was not by either man, but instead by the American ping pong team in April of that year. Ping pong diplomacy was nearly followed by the visit of a democratic politician rather than of a Nixon aide. Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield was one of the many within the Democratic Party who, like Nixon, favored an opening to China. While the American table tennis team was in China, Mansfield received an invitation to visit the country from the Beijing government. And Nixon initially encouraged Mansfield to accept the invitation and discuss with Kissinger using the Democratic senator to pass a message to the Chinese leadership. Soon thereafter, however, Premier Zhou Enlai invited Kissinger himself to visit China. With his own aid traveling, Nixon worked to delay Mansfield's visit until both Kissinger and then he himself had made their trips, with Mansfield ultimately traveling in May 1972, three months after Nixon. Nixon delayed Mansfield's travel, not because he worried that the senator would make a poor emissary, but because the trip of a senior Democrat would dilute the sense that his own visit was a Republican initiative and that only Nixon could go to China. So I wanted to focus my presentation today on critiquing this most powerful myth of the US-China rapprochement. But there are other powerful narratives surrounding the Sino-American relationship of the 1970s that are also at least partially misleading and that have a powerful influence on the relationship today. And I'll quickly discuss two of those now, and we'll be glad to return to them in the Q&A if there's interest in examining them in greater detail. The first of these is the narrative of Sino-American rapprochement as triangular diplomacy. The term triangular diplomacy refers to the role of geopolitical alignment between China and the United States against the Soviet Union. As with the narrative of only Nixon going to China, there is some important truth here. The early stages of the rapprochement were indeed strongly motivated by both sides' desire to gain leverage against the shared enemy of the Soviet Union. However, the logic of triangular diplomacy is often applied to the entirety of the US-China relationship during the Cold War up to 1991 as a shared crusade against the Soviet Union that resulted in victory for Washington and for Beijing. The historical record of Sino-American diplomacy shows that this significantly oversimplifies the complexity of the relationship. Indeed, within two years of Nixon's visit to China, triangular diplomacy had broken down as a positive influence on the relationship. Chairman Mao Zedong was, by 1974, condemning the United States for, quote, climbing on Chinese shoulders to reach Moscow, that is, for exploiting rapprochement with the PRC to reach detente with the Soviets. Thus, in the mid-1970s, it was other aspects of the relationship that determined the quality of ties between the United States and China. Anti-Soviet collusion returned as a binding agent in the relationship in 1978 and was one factor behind the agreement to officially establish Sino-American diplomatic relations that year. But again, within a few years, Mao's ultimate successor, Deng Xiaoping, felt that the United States was exploiting this aspect of the relationship and was also beginning to believe that his earlier conclusion that the Soviets were the greater long-term danger to China had been mistaken. Thereafter, Deng sought to chart more of a middle road between the two superpowers and ultimately pursued a new rapprochement with the Soviet Union 
through the second half of the 1980s. The final narrative about Sino-American relations in the 1970s that I want to mention today is one that has been the source of much attention in the last few years. This final narrative is that beginning in the 1970s, the United States transferred huge amounts of knowledge and technology to China in a short-sighted act motivated by exuberance or by charity, and that this knowledge and technology played a central role in facilitating China's meteoric economic and technological rise. Again, there is some basis for this narrative. The United States did indeed act as perhaps the most important source of outside knowledge and technology during Deng's Ford modernizations campaign that sought to overhaul China by the end of the 20th century. However, one aspect of the narrative, as often told today, is misleading. This was not at all something that was done unknowingly by the United States. Indeed, at the very moment that Deng was officially adopting the Four Modernizations Policy in 1978, a high-level internal US government document included the injunction for the United States not to play Santa Claus when it came to scientific cooperation between the two sides. US government officials were clear-sighted in perceiving that China, while in the short term a Cold War tacit ally, was in the long term always likely to be something like the peer competitor it is described as today. Thus, the benefits of scientific cooperation in the 1970s and beyond were calculated in the knowledge of this ultimate outcome. That is, the United States contributed to Chinese scientific modernization because it perceived that doing so served its interests as well as those of China. And indeed, there were numerous tangible benefits. China sent thousands and thousands of its most talented students to the United States. American scientists gained access to China's scientific space and the opportunity to collaborate with Chinese colleagues. And the global scientific community benefited from advances and discoveries achieved by Chinese scientists working abroad and at home. Why is all of this important? Beyond setting the record straight, as historians like to do, I think that these three narratives all continue to play an important role in memories of the origins of the Sino-American relationship today. The first two narratives I've discussed, that only Nixon can go to China and that the basis of the US-China relationship is triangular geostrategic collusion, have emphasized a memory of a Cold War relationship that was a strategic marriage of convenience. In fact, the relationship was far more multifaceted and much deeper for being so. Even during the Cold War, the relationship between Chinese and American societies was as important as ties between the two governments. This is critical for us to remember in an era like our own, in which the geostrategic aspect of the relationship is no longer a source of unity, but a major cause of division. The third narrative that the United States unwittingly or naively helped create the powerful modern China of today through scientific cooperation has an even more nefarious influence. It helps underpin allegations that China has unfairly exploited the Sino-American relationship in order to facilitate its economic expansion at the expense of the United States. China, of course, has gained a great deal from scientific interactions with the outside, perhaps especially with the United States. And there are individual instances of foul play within that scientific relationship. But at least in the 1970s, Sino-American scientific cooperation was an arrangement that was knowingly facilitated by US elected representatives who believed it served US interests. Close attention to the historical record will not alone bring about more salubrious relations between China and the United States today. But I do think identifying and unpicking some of the narratives and myths that are forwarded about the origins of today's relationship will help us to better understand how new narratives are being constructed and for what purposes. Thank you, I look forward to the the further paper and the discussion.
it's nice that we can clap yeah. <laughs> that, that you actually came to us in person. Thank you, Pete, for that very fascinating talk. I have so many questions already, and I'm sure the audiences have as well. But this is a this is part of you. Is it one chapter of your book? Um, no, not really. I think it's uh, just some some ideas that I had when when writing it. So some of those ideas are expressed in the book, but it's, it's not a chapter as such. No. So Pete also a book which is under contract with Cambridge University Press on. Um, scientific and cultural exchange um, between China and US in the 1970s. That's right, yeah. What is the title of the book? Uh, that was on the first slide, The Improbable Sorry. Diplomats title. So I was uh, looking through. Uh, yeah. When Impro do you expect it to get up? Uh, it's gone through the final review, so I think maybe in the summer or the autumn of next year. Sounds okay. good. So if you're interested more in this topic and, and Pete's fascinating approach to it, please look out for uh, Pete's book that should be out soon. And congratulations <laughs> on your you. first book. Uh, okay, we will um, please save your questions for the, the Q&A time. If you have any questions and you can type them into the chat box or you can speak out during the Q&A session, whichever you prefer. I can read your questions for you or you can uh, speak out. Okay, thank you again, Pete. Um, our next and last speaker in this panel is Upasana Banerjee. Um, who is an independent research scholar with a postgraduate degree in comparative literature from Jadavpur University. And her research interests lie in indie queer activism, black feminism, Marxist feminism, and South Asian culture and literature. And I love this sentence that she wrote, she breathes in heavy metal music. I think we can see that on your on your T-shirt today. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Pasana. Please um, start when you are ready. Do, are you going to share your your screen with us? No, I do not have any PPT to share. I would like to present my paper by myself. So okay, uh, sounds good. Uh, Hello everyone, a uh, very good morning. I am Upashwana Banerjee, an independent research scholar. My paper is titled as Tracing the Roots of Heroism in Superman, Counter Narratives of Communism in Cold War Theory. Cold War basically denotes an era of ideological conflict between two major political protagonists, the United States of America and the Soviet Union, or Union of Soviet Socialist Republics during 1947 to approximately 1991. Cold War not only describes the construction of an international political system as an immediate ideological conflict between two powerful political territories, but it situates as an expression of difference in economic, social, and cultural practices where the proxies influence the war to be entangled within larger socio-political economic disagreement through their independent projects, opinions, and creative associations. To simplify the intense and critical causality of Cold War, the opponents can be regarded as capitalists on one side and communists influenced by the Bolshevik Revolution of 1970 on the other. Cold War brings the importance of diplomacy to resolve political conflicts that denied advisories regime and legitimacy. Interestingly, the approach of replacing, uh, replacing diplomacy as the ideology and propaganda resulted in the very disapproving theory that Cold War has ended in 1991, where many countries prefer to narrate their part as the political victims during the Cold War, which still impacts their economic ability to sustain along with a major unsettling between their political administration and ideological socio-cultural beliefs. Hence, the major cause of the Cold War remains unclear with many school of historians like traditionalist school or revisionist school failing to provide an unbiased and unfiltered Cold War historiography that is devoid of ideological coloration. Therefore, to understand Cold War, one must identify it as an influential era in global historiography with individual political actors directly or indirectly supporting a political ideology. 
Cold War situates with extreme importance in the course of global history as it presents the actors performing to sustain with their political ideology, which is apart from the relative value judgment, appears as critical, uh, circumstantial, and a major display of power play. My intention is to shed light on the fact that the influence of the United States of America and the USSR as two major global powers of that time was significantly contributed in creating a political or social ideology that instigated many countries to directly or indirectly involved in the Cold War, contributing to a conflicting and critical theory of the war itself. In accordance of my opinion, I intend to clarify my point of understanding the time of time period of Cold War ends in 1991 with the dissolution of the Soviet Union that partially concluded the global political advertisement of the presence of the Cold War in the global scenario, when in reality, the ideological conflict between capitalism and communism struggled to exist in even through very sensitive political matters till today. Recently, historians have accepted the Cold War as uh, an multi multiple expression of contextualizations, meanings, political approaches with multiple meanings. Therefore, speaking of the term Cold War means a broader and longer perspective on international and global transformations in the current context. Here I address the new possibilities of the critical thinking influenced by the Cold War propaganda by acknowledging the prioritization to address the heterogeneity of the global south as the center of the academic and political discourse yes. then an intrinsic uh, focus on the euro-atlantic supremacy of discourses as we focus into the expanding territories of the cold war diplomacy we focus on to a bigger scenario of power structure by emphasizing on the marginals through the embracing acceptance of the transnational identities, domestic and cultural practices, intellectual and economic history in approaches with a sincere acknowledgement of human rights in official statements. Explaining the Cold War with broadening historical knowledge parallel to the expansion of its geographical location and figurative space, I bring the importance of Global South within the parameter of Cold War and explain the fabricated narrative that uh, has resulted in a global anti-communist propaganda. My intention approaches the very aspect of ideological supremacy in Cold War theory, which needs to be understood within its conditions and circumstances. To emphasize on a single ideological narrative has impacted into a Cold War narrative that is partially true and caters to the giant capitalistic entrepreneurs with a progressive practice of modern slavery or free labor. To understand Cold War from a neutral point of judgment requires a multifaceted knowledge of transnational, global, international change of the early 20th century that primarily confronted as the period of Cold War, even though there are disagreements on the overarching centrality of the notion itself. To resonate with my arguments, I focus on Mark Miller's Superman Red Sun and Arthur Miller's The Crucibles to theoretically justify my points of criticism and provide an analysis. My intention to work with two literary devices brings, bring, brings under the light of the multifaceted impacts of Cold War felt and developed by two authors in two popular literary platforms. I consciously chose to work with two authors from two different time period to approach Cold War as they have understood either from their own experiences or from the systematic institutional learning, which is again a direct impact of the diplomatic political supremacy of Cold War that replaced regimented dictatorial rule, but initiated a silent but forceful power oppression on many countries, including the United States of America and the Soviet Union territories as well. Superman Red Sun was published in 2003 in three mini series issues known as Red Sun Rising, Red Sun uh, Ascendant, and Red Sun Setting. Uh, under the Ellsworld imprint of Detective Comics, it was written by Mark Miller with astounding artworks by Dave Johnson. Superman Red Sun is slightly different than the rest of the superhero issues as it brings our very American Superman to Russian soil and projects him as true communist hero. 
The first issue, Red Sun Rising, initiates the beginning of the story in 1950, where our Superman is a Russian common man turned hero, upsetting the nuclear arms race narrative of Cold War into a superpower one and truly embarking as a people's man, a true communist hero. The first issue basically creates a plot for our last Kryptonian as a grassroots leader by depicting him kind and generous against the capitalist Lex Luthor, who happens to be a scientist at Star Laboratories. Superman at this part of the story appears within the closer circle of Stalin where Lex Luthor presents himself as a narcissistic, opportunistic, regressive and disrespectful of his wife, Louise Lane. Louise Lane, otherwise feminist, independent journalist, helps her corrupt, corrupt husband to cause Sputnik 2 to plummet towards Metropolis, resulting in a romantic meeting between Superman and her, along with the trace of a bizarre clone of the Superman. The story further involves Wonder Woman, Piotr, the chief of NKVD, and Stalin's who is also known as Stalin's illegitimate son. Pyotr poisons Stalin and Superman appears as the leader of the party after initial decline. Meanwhile, Superman meets Lana uh, Lazareko that changes his perception about his work and he finally engages to deliver for the greater good of humanity. Here comes the setting of the second issue, Red Sun Ascendant, depicting mostly about Soviet, post Soviet prosperity, about communism, and satellites beyond political warfare. It depicts a very conflicting political administration in the United States of America, on the contrary, with continuous imagery of riots in California, Texas, whereas Superman's leadership has influenced Soviet Union virtually to eliminate poverty, disease with utmost importance of individual liberties. Interestingly, Superman becomes like a big brother figure uh, with suppressing involvement in distant political matters. In this plot, again Lex Luthor conspires with an unarmed anarchist boy who believes Superman as dictatorial and intrusive of his cit citizens' lives. This boy, framed as Batman, along with Piotr, the head of the KGB, joins Lex Luthor to conspire against Superman, where Wonder Woman appears and saves him finally. Luther finds a mysterious Green Lantern in an alien ship crashed in New Mexico, which he uses to program Brainiac for killing Superman. This begins the entrance of the last issue, Red Sun setting, where the United States of America is seen to be devastated by the conflict of civil war. The interference of Superman is seen in the scenario helping the South Asian countries like South, like Korea to win against the United States of America where the Superman itself justifies the brutality of mass killings and violence that seeks to uh, provide peace and liberty. Interestingly, Superman, once truly committed to humanity, transitions to a dictator in the name of serving humanity. When Lex Luthor confronts uh, Superman in Siberia, it much appears that the legacy of Superman is destroyed once he continues to perform as a communist leader. Superman refuses Brainiac, hope, uh, hoping to diplomatically win against the United States of America, but ultimately Stalingrad remains as his sole failure. Lex Luthor succeeds in earning presidentship at the United States election and forces Superman to attack through the dialogic conflict. Superman's power earns him physical victory, but returning to White House, he receives a note from Lex Luthor that states, why doesn't Superman put the whole world into a bottle? Superman reading this orders Brainiac to stop the invasion, failing to do so because of its programming error, Superman pushes it into the outer space where it blows up. As a direct result, Soviet Union finally falls and Luther integrates his ideas into Lutherism to form a global United States curing diseases and colonialism. The final of the story assures that Superman is immortal and he returns as Jor-El. The final timeline describes the infant son of Jor-El and Lara returning and causing a 
predestination paradox effectively. In the analysis of this particular text, what strikes the most is the transition of the Superman itself. He had the perfect ability to serve for the humanity, but power corrupted him. It is important that Stalin's death marks as a pivotal period in the storyline as it changes Superman from a common man's hero to a true dictator. It is again controversial that Superman's involvement in the liberation war of many South Asian countries became interfering and oppressive. The American Superman chooses to acknowledge his infinite superpowers even when he is politically confronted, whereas Mark Miller's communist Superman as true to his ideology so much that he does not hesitate to conduct war for negotiating against the diplomatic policy of the United States of America. Lex Luthor, on the other side, is uh, positioned as a human figure whose crimes have a logical human explanation. On the contrary, Superman's place is constructed so high from moral and ideological context since the very beginning that his flaws in moral decisions tend to impact the global dynamics of the political scene. Brainiac's construction can also be seen as a true projection of the otherwise if Superman could deviate from the ideological stance as he was already doing so while actively engaging in the civil war movement. Mark Miller's Superman Redson portrays that every each risk of a dictatorial authoritarian shift that is said to malfunction the communist ideology. When his meeting of Lana Lazareko in the fictional setup of Gulag influenced his human desire to serve the humanity in a different way that involved active power demonstration, it was conceived that the novel uh, lacks to identify with the true meaning of communist ideas while trying to convince it as a counterpart of passive authoritarianism. In this specific discussion, I intend to explain and critic author Miller's The Crucibles, narrating the story, story of Reverend Samuel Paris and his daughter Betty, with 17-year-old niece Abigail, who, he, who happens to be a slave. The narrative is about Betty's illness, which was discovered after she was dancing in the wood with Abigail and other local slave girls. Betty is convicted of witchcraft. Rebecca and Elizabeth, a nurse, confronted Betty's illness as a childish phase and has nothing to do with witchcraft. Divided into four acts, the final of the play shows Pregnant Elizabeth getting hanged in front of husband Pector due to witch hunt trial. This play interestingly resonates with some of the strict American propaganda of anti-communist aesthetic and cultural practices. Arthur Miller himself states the horror of constructing the skeleton of the play as the political administration of the United States of America was extremely violent of the communist ideas. The witch hunt trial of the play similarizes with the American violence of targeting artists and creative thinkers to force their ideology on them. Understanding the popularity of such authors and literary platforms, such act of imposed notion of ideas seem to contradict with the American portrayal of libertarianism itself. It also shows the continuous act of power imposition that fabricates the true sense of the term communism. Finally, in conclusion, I would like to say the exact origin of Cold War seems confrontational in terms of complexity and controversy. It becomes essential to focus on the international systems and contextual events to illuminate the ideological crisis of the time period termed as the Cold War. The broader historiographical approach of Cold War impacting a hegemonic cultural contest also focuses on the development of multiple identities, shifting interpretations and new discourses. Therefore, it's time to critically analyze the significance of Cold War beyond anti-communist or anti-Soviet propaganda. Apart from the superpower conditions, Cold War's dynamics situate in the politics of the contestation of the post-war global political order with conscious attempts from the left political agency to challenge global capitalist institutional orders 
Superman Redson and the Crucibles both present alternative narratives of the Cold War policies, reconnecting with the importance of acknowledging multiple parameters of cultural hegemony and the boundaries of historical imagination redefined by multiple connections of changes, changing agents with corresponding attention to North, South, East, West interactions of investigation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pashana, for this really fascinating paper, which prompts me to ask, is it is it part of a larger ongoing research that you have on... on Actually, uh, I mostly work uh, in indigenous square advocacy, uh, but while uh, working for this seminar, I actually took interest to know more about this conflicting aspect of what we uh, understand when we speak of Cold War, what time period uh, we try to resonate with or act, uh, identify with or correspond to when we speak of the term Cold War. And I found this amazing literary devices trying to continuously challenge our intellectual ideas and conventional narratives of what we know as communism and what we know as Cold War and the participation of major countries as direct participants or indirect participants of this war. Thank you. Wonderful. Is there any venue where we can read your work or you intend to publish? Uh, uh, right now, I am actually uh, trying to apply for a doctoral uh, study so that I can fund my research. I would like to do that institutionally. So I'm writing my proposals right now, but uh, I, I can provide my email and uh, everyone is very much welcome to directly email me and talk to me so that we can discuss. And that would also help me to know more about this topic. That's so wonderful. anyone who would like to talk and email me directly and we can sincerely have a nice conversation. Great. Would you like to include your email in the chat so people sure, uh, sure. can see? I think yeah. I'm the first one who's going to write it. So <laughs> it's so a much. fascinating topic. Oh, thank you. Thank you again while you're uh, providing your email. Wonderful. We had two really great papers today, and I think we already have questions. Before that, uh, I would just like to reflect a little bit. I will not take too much time of the Q&A, but what uh, was particularly interesting about and inspiring about the two talks today is um, looking beyond the institutional narratives and discourses, I would say. And when I say beyond that, uh, we have to go through so many layers because on the one hand, you have institutional in terms of the state of the political side of the media. Uh, but then the second layer of the institutional discourse is the education, how universities and, and schools are teaching this uh, fragment and not only this part of history, but history in general. So... Um, it's fascinating to see a different kind of engagement with history. And my, my um, biggest question to which I will return, I will save that question for after we've heard from the audience would be, how does this, what we have just heard, change the way that we write and think history? And what is the potential impact uh, for such work, such beyond the institutional and transnational perspective to do to diversify the way that we do history. And we know that historiography, the way we write history is, is pretty problematic and that we do need more diversification. Um, so I will, I will save that and I will come back to that because I want to prioritize our audience and audience's questions. So let's start with uh, Catherine Fox, uh, who is asking Pete, I'm wondering if you know more about the various vectors of the transmission of technology from the US to China. To what degree were these transfers overseen by the US government agents versus a laissez-faire attitude to lobbyists, universities, or corporate forces? Thank you, Catherine. Okay, um, so I, I can say a little bit. Thanks, Catherine, for the question. 
uh, a very good question. I can say a little bit about the 1970s. In the 1970s, uh, I think there was considerable pressure coming from below. American companies were unsurprisingly interested in selling technology to China. This was true even before Mao's death. And Boeing, for example, sold their first 10 airplanes to, to China in the early 1970s while Mao was still alive. And Mao personally approved the sale, sorry, the purchasing of American and other Western technology um, after 1971 in the last half decade of, of his life. And American companies were very, were very interested in, uh, in, in, in this. The American government's perspective on this was, was uh, somewhat complex. Because of the nature of the Cold War, there were limits on what technology was permitted to be transferred to communist countries. And China, of course, was, uh, was considered amongst those, those countries. But already by the mid 1970s, during the Gerald Ford presidency, when Henry Kissinger was still Secretary of State, the US government started taking a very favorable approach to technology transfers to China. And they saw a number of reasons for doing so, including uh, helping China modernize its technology and its, in its Cold War competition with the Soviet Union, which would make it a more useful ally, but also in strengthening the relationship with the United States. And in a conversation between Ford and Deng Xiaoping during Ford's 1975 visit to China, Deng specifically asked Ford to, and Kissinger as well, to take a more favorable approach to these technology transfers. And Ford personally pledged to Deng that he would do so. And thereafter, Kissinger and Ford worked to circumvent their own government's laws that prohibited or restricted these transfers of technology and often made sales and transfers of technology in the years that followed to China that would probably not have been possible, that would not have been sold to the Soviet Union, for example, or would not have taken place had it not been for the intervention of the US government. Under the Carter administration, which took power in 77, this policy more or less continued, and Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, was also very enthusiastic about having uh, technology transferred to China, and Deng, who was now, uh, or was at that point becoming paramount leader of China, remained very interested, interested in American technology. So there was pressure from below, and American businesses were very interested in this, but there was also interest from the Chinese, and the US government did what they could to facilitate this. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, Catherine, I hope that um, you're satisfied with Pete's reply. And um, let's see. Uh, Cherian is asking Upashana, any thoughts on how superhero comics have evolved more recently? Oh, sorry. You wrote in brackets so you can ask that in person. You should write that at the beginning. <laughs> I, I don't know whether this also we to test the our powerful mic system. Uh, I hope I'm audible. I should be. Okay, Upashana, can you hear Cherian here? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. It's wonderful. It works. So we have this brand new, very democratic mic system that. Uh, Which I'm controlling. In the room. <laughs> so uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Sana. I'm, I'm not a fan of heavy metal, but I do. Uh, identify with uh, superhero comics. And uh, one um, one thought that I had was that in more recent years, although it's absolutely true that the the, uh, the superhero comics that we looked at um, decades ago were highly ideological in their own ways. Uh, but it's interesting how um, uh, DC and Marvel have tried to, um, to update their uh, their, their comics in more recent decades becoming uh, uh, even quite politically correct, so to speak. So there are there are brown skin, black skin, women, uh, Muslim superheroes in a way that even alienates some of their own uh, traditional fans. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What's what's going on in popular culture that uh, the U.S. Uh, in although widely accused of using popular culture to uh, to promote its own uh, geopolitical agenda in the past, in some cases. Now, uh, it, it, to some American eye, it seems to be bending over backwards to uh, to accommodate um, the viewpoints from the global south and from minorities and so on. Do you follow them? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Thank you for your question. And um, 
I have been uh, waiting since long to speak on something like this because though I have not worked much uh, about superheroes or on superheroes, but recently I have seen that uh, in terms of graphic novels and in terms of representation of the superheroes, we have become more progressive. Uh, recently, I worked on a graphic novel. It's a uh, it's titled as The Basket Pool of Heads. It's written by Joe Hill. Uh, the protagonist is basically a female character who uh, falls into a very unpleasant situation. Unpleasant, if explained uh, through certain terms, can be regressive, uh, conservative, uh, very unconventional and uncomfort uncomfortable for a woman to be in. But why am I telling of this uh, particular graphic novel? I intend to acknowledge this graphic novel by portraying, by associating the protagonist female character as a super hero. And I do so because she uh, gets a superpower where she transitions from a completely normal woman to a completely violent person, stripping her uh, opinions uh, attacking the persons who are trying to dishonor her or trying to take her advantages. So this is a very interesting uh, stance if you look at it, because if we also look at the trajectories of how Wonder Woman as a character, as a female superhero protagonist evolved, and if we look at this protagonist character from Basket Full of Heads, we can see that the way we have tried to portray the female superheroes and their reactions to different circumstantiality has also changed. And I believe that it has changed because of the current social political turmoil that we are going through right now. And also in terms of the development, uh, there is a rumor I do not, I'm, uh, I'm certainly not sure of whether DC is going to uh, make their Batman a black character, but at, I'm trying to raise this particular aspect as well when you ask me this question, because I also do believe that when you try to develop and rupture a narrative, you need to understand that the basic circumstantiality where you first put that narrative. When Batman was created as a character, when I try to analyze his superpower, I see Batman as a privileged character because even though his parents were killed, he had all the opportunities to raise himself, his ideology of humanity above everything and portray himself as a true uh, symbol of morality because he had that privilege which I could say when I was uh, talking about this comic Superman Red Sun and when I was talking about this Batman, this Batman had did not have that privilege. So when in terms of, uh, when uh, we speak of the narratives of the development of the graphic novels, we need to understand the circumstantiality and the conditions upon which these narratives are framed because even though Superman Red Sun portrays Superman as a communist character, as a true people's hero, but it ultimately fails to portray how communism should actually be idealized like. So I believe that uh, in terms of the development of the graphic novels, there are still more opportunities to think critically, which I believe that uh, some of the very established platforms like uh, Detective Comics and Marvel is still lacking. And I would also like to talk about one graphic novel, uh, which is uh, written by Amruta Patel, which is uh, titled as Kari. Kari is also about a superwoman. If we also look at this graphic novel by uh, transitioning uh, it as a super a hero or super villain graphic novel, we would see that the projection of morality, the projection of social entitlement of virtue 
and serving humanity has changed regionally. So uh, I think for uh, DC and Marvel, there are more windows to critically analyze the opportunities first on the stances we are projecting these superheroes like we are when we are talking about batman we are talking about morality when we are talking about superman we are talking about virtue so i think we also need to circumstantially analyze and uh, experience the socio cultural entitlement of the understanding virtue honor humanity when we uh, develop the narratives or when we develop the understanding of the theme superhero as we project in the graphic novel or in the movies. I hope uh, I'm, I have been able to answer your question. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from Dylan, who is uh, asking Pete, I'm wondering how you understand the implications of your narratives for not only US-China relations, but also how we see the work of foreign policy as a whole. What does your research tell us about who does foreign policy and how foreign policy gets determined and accomplished? Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. A uh, couple of thoughts. I'm just, just thinking through your, your thoughtful question. I think one of the points that I'd, I'd say in terms of maybe I keep the question. Oh, sorry, yes, okay. I'll do that. Um, maybe one of the the points I'd say in terms of um, the the implications of these narratives for U.S.-China relations today is this shared memory in the United States, but but more broadly perhaps as well um, about the origins of the U.S.-China relationship. Because I think the 1970s is this formative decade in which the the relationship developed, but also um, the, the basis for how the relationship is, is remembered today and how it's seen today. And I think it's often remembered as somewhat unbalanced relationship, perhaps one in which uh, the two sides got different things from one another, but um, that, that had this unbalanced nature. And I think while that isn't necessarily uh, completely misleading, as I said in, in the talk, I think it's important for us to unpick how historical actors were very aware of this and how the perhaps the asymmetry in the relationship nonetheless still was, was a consciously addressed one and one that did have its own internal balance during the 1970s, all of which is to say that Americans that were involved in dealing with China in the 1970s were not duped by, by China, but instead had a clear sense of what they were gaining from the relationship, what they, how, they, how the United States could benefit from it, how American society could benefit from the relationship, while in turn, uh, Chinese leaders were also very conscious of this and, and perhaps others in Chinese society as well. More broadly, in terms of the second part of your question, how we see this as foreign policy as a whole, I think maybe something I was alluding to, but I didn't really say too much about, is how new ways of remembering the US-China relationship is also a way of crafting foreign policy and making arguments for foreign policy. And I think we've certainly seen that in the last um, 10 or so years, not just during the Trump presidency, but before that as well, how a recasting and how um, a discussion of the origins of the US-China relationship, not just in the 70s, but in the decades that followed as well, is a way of making normative points about how US-China relations should proceed and how US policy towards, towards China should be shaped. And as I said at the end of the presentation, I think it's important for us to remember the actual, um, the actual history of this and to correct statements that are, that are misleading. But I also think it's important for us to while reflecting on, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, to, to see things as historical actors did and to, uh, to understand the way that politicians and foreign policy makers today, particularly those who are politicians, um, use this history and use these memories to, to make cases for foreign policy into the future. I hope that there's a, um, perhaps not into, entirely clear thoughts, but, but some thoughts in response to your thoughtful question. Thanks. Okay, Dylan, hope that answers your question. If you'd like to follow up, you're more, more, most welcome. 
Um, do we have more questions? Watch out, I have a lot. If I start, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to ask yours. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Any questions? Well, while we are waiting for more questions, I actually do have, I wasn't joking about having questions. <laughs> I was only joking about monopolizing the chat. Um, I would like to go back to my uh, immediate comment after, the, after both presentations. And I was wondering if both Upashana and Pete, you could, you could reflect on that a little bit on how, we, how your particular approaches to this part of history affects our history writing, understanding of history, um, and also how we can relate it to um, continuous perpetuation of very similar discourses today. Um, and continuous perpetuation after the end of the end, sort of not, not really the end of the Cold Wars, but more of a continuation through the discourse. So uh, the question for both Upashana and Pete, how does that, what is your intention? How do you want our understanding and writing about the Cold War to change uh, through your work, through your particular perspectives? No, who wants to go first? Um, shall we start with Upashana, perhaps? And... Sure. May I speak first then? Yes, please, go ahead. I believe that uh, at first I would like to address the fact that history is very much conditioned by geography. So whenever we are trying to address the historiography of any particular event, and when it is an important event like Old War, we need to uh, understand it and uh, educate ourselves about it by understanding the geographical and the circumstantial conditions of the Cold War around the globe. Because we know that different countries apart from uh, the Soviet Union and the United States of America participated directly or indirectly into the Cold War or uh, was a part, uh, was playing a part of the role of the victim in the Cold War. And through my research, what I intend to bring is a critical intellectual analysis of the existing texts. That is why I chose Arthur Miller's The Crucibles, which is an important uh, text and is also very familiar for different reasons, because it mostly associates with the idea of Puritanism. But I tried to use this text in the context of Cold War because I intended to make my audiences and readers think that existing texts are also conditioned by geographies and the socio-cultural problems and turmoil. So in order to know a specific incident like Cold War, it is also important to know the literary devices, the creative expressions and the aesthetic practices and cultural beliefs of the people who were associated with the war directly or indirectly, and what were their experiences. And in accordance to that, I chose Mark Miller's Superman Redson, which is a very uh, relatively new text than Arthur Miller's Crucible, because I also intended to show that even though we challenge this notion that Cold War has ended in 1991, it has not because of the the conscious political propaganda that remained after Cold War and impacted various discourses. And from that discourses only we have concluded to this understanding of global South and global North, where we are trying to uh, contradict with modernized concept of global North by projecting the cultural practices and rich cultural uh, treasures of the global South. So I do believe that as a part of knowing a historical event entirely, I intend to focus on the geographical as well as the circumstantial social cultural influences 
and I also intend to critically think on the factor that till uh, the twenty. Uh, till the last of the 20th century, we only talked about the impact of Cold War and how uh, it dismantled the economic, political, social, ideological structure of many countries, social system, how it bared many uh, artists to uh, express themselves properly, to speak of their mind, but we did not actually try to invest much on how many artists were resisting, were trying to create an alternative framework to represent an alternative th theory of communism, which was propagated uh, with fabrication during the time of Cold War and which is still being fabricated right now. And I do believe that in the course of academic learning, we also intend to uh, engage with our own socio-cultural experiences as well. Like when we talk about Cold War, I being a citizen from a South Asian country, from India, I intend to speak to my own parents or grandparents understanding their own experiences of the Cold War or of that uh, speculative time period to know how it impacted and to resonate with with the conservative historiography to create a critical thinking and understand uh, Cold War as a dimension where it is not unbiased, where it is not biased or fabricated or colored by any certain opinion. I hope that uh, helps to uh, suffice your question. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. Pete, would you like? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. Thanks for the thoughtful question. It's, it's quite a broad question. Um, maybe I'll start with a fairly narrow response, which is the the, the book that we mentioned before that I that I that I finished writing was trying to make a historiographical point, and and I showed it, one of my first slides in the presentation was about the diplomatic historiography and how U.S.-China relations are history of the 1970s, but I think the Cold War U.S.-China relationship more broadly has, until very recently, been predominantly, overwhelmingly focused on uh, the history of governmental relations and on uh, that sort of. We can call it Cold War if we want, but there are many different types of Cold War. So, so perhaps I'll just say sort of geopolitical and um, diplomatic relations between between the two sides. And the book is trying um, to do uh, to do something to at least partially correct this and to use different sources, sources from beyond uh, the the two governments, and to look at other types of interactions, transnational societal interactions and to get at the relationship between the two societies as well. And I think part of the part of what I was trying to do with the book was to fill out that history and offer a more holistic history and incorporate a more diverse range of actors than we had previously when we were focusing on the government level. But maybe historiographically, it was also trying to connect these two historiographies as well and not say that the previous diplomatic geopolitical historiography is not without value. I think it is very valuable. I think it has played an important role. And I think now what, I, what I'm trying to do and what I think um, others are interested in as well is connecting the history of other types of interactions between China and the United States, between the two societies, with this diplomatic uh, historiography and showing that there's a mutual interaction between those two levels of the relationship and how they're mutually constitutive. And I think if I want, if I was going to try and make a, a broader historiographical point, but you know perhaps I'm not, I wouldn't. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say what I want other historians of the Cold War to do, but I do think that that is an interesting point that may be of some use for others to look at the the question of how high-level geopolitical relationships during the Cold War, not only between superpowers, but between other states as well, connected with societal interactions, transnational interactions um, during that period. And, and, you know, we have increasingly very good histories at, at both of those levels, but I think there's added value if we try and connect those historiographies and show the mutual interaction. And I think so a conference like this is, is an interesting location to try to do so, to put those two different levels um, in, in conversation with one another. Great, thank you. Um, hey, do we have questions from the audience? Okay, 
no questions. In that case, uh, we had uh, very interesting questions. Thank you to those who have asked questions. Um, thank you to Upashana and Pete. Oh, we have, I saw something popping up. It's not popping up on my screen. Ah, it's popping up now. Oh, is that you fooling around? <laughs> uh, we have amazing technical support here. Um, so um, thank you to Pashana and thank you. Um, if we don't have any last questions while I uh, tune us off, uh, please do, do type in or, or uh, tune in quickly uh, to stop me from closing the session. <laughs> very, very general question. Yes, a please. Very, very general question, which is, um, I, I wonder if you were listening to Luke Menard's uh, lecture earlier, and I wonder if you had any reactions or responses to the kind of uh, historiographical challenges uh, that he laid out in terms of the cultural history of the Cold War. He made a distinction between that and that. I wonder what you think of that distinction. And also just the, you know, the, the most banal situation of how even non sloppy work can get things profoundly wrong. Yeah, I think maybe maybe one point. I, it was a very interesting keynote, and there's lots of interesting things um, for, for all of us to think about. I'm not, I don't consider myself a cultural historian, even though I do look at cultural interactions um, in in the U.S.-China relationship. But I am interested in in the cultural aspects of those and how how that proved interesting. But it's not perhaps sort of the core of my focus or the theme that, that guys thinks. But I think this point about, about getting things right, I think is, is really important. And I think in the Cold War, it can be tempting to read back into earlier periods. He was talking about the 1950s, for example, things that uh, maybe were the case later or that people believed to be the case at a later point, which was a sort of parallel point I was making about, about US-China relations. And I think it's very important for historians and those that are doing historical work, even if they're not historians, to be very precise about not only you know, what George Kennan said, but also about what level of influence different ideas had at, had at different times. And the keynote reflected on that it's, of course, very difficult to do so, but I think it's important for us not to just assume that because the historiography has paid attention to something or because we have a strong memory of something, that that was felt by historical actors at the time, instead to try and you know, inductively look at the evidence that we have for the influence of ideas or movements or um, you know, any type of, sort of cultural formation and idea and to, to test that against the evidence from the time. Great. Is that you again? Okay. Oh, we have another one from Catherine Fox. Wondering what you think about the more recent pop culture phenomenon that I presume is derived from earlier iterations of feminism of the recuperation celebration of the figure of the witch and whether this plays into your analysis on communism and anti-communism in the previous generation. Upshana, um, Upashana, um, ready to respond? Um, Do you need me to repeat the question? Can you see the question? Yeah, I can see that question. Can okay, great. Uh, one more, uh, one recent cultural fem phenomenon that I see about this imagery of witchcraft and its association with feminism, mostly in uh, in many in popular platforms, I would like to speak of one. Netflix is one of the most popular platforms right now that showcases many uh, serials and series that uh, actively work in the field of feminism. And I have recently seen this trend that um, idealizing Lilith as uh, a revolutionary character brings uh, together, the intersectionality of, I do believe, a progressive feminism with a radical imagination in this uh, postmodern idea of feministic uh, display of characterism, characteristics or, of, or discourses 
but it is i do believe is kindly problematic to some of the context uh, because as i say that uh, when i talk about uh, crucibles when i try to associate this anti-communistic propaganda with the witchcraft trial, I do so consciously because I uh, am reading Arthur Miller where he is stating himself that uh, he was uh, forced to uh, construct this play because he was not able to uh, talk about his freedom of expression uh, on the American soil freely during the time of this Cold War period. And uh, this way of restricting to speak about your opinion or present your own artistic expression sometimes uh, also can be, uh, can be seen as a passive way of uh, restricting people uh, to create a fabricating narrative, I do believe, which is uh, popular right now about communism in many of the South Asian countries right now. But in terms of the feministic uh, display, I do believe that this is a way of a generation, a specific community might uh, try to project themselves by thinking Lilith as their ideal, where they consciously do believe that they have this expression, this liberty to do whatever they like to do. And I think that there is a community who still believes in practicing uh, rituals, who does altar sessions. But in terms of my idea of associating this idea of witchcraft with uh, uh, anti-communistic propaganda is because of the direct statements and the research that I found on while working on uh, Arthur Miller where he clearly states that he was restricted, forced and he was scared of speaking of his mind because he did not comply with the regulations, the ad political, administrative, restrictive doctrines of the United, government of the United States of America at that moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, closing once again. So if you have any more questions, you can ask while I'm closing. Uh, thank you again, um, Upashana and Pete for, for joining the conference and uh, doing such a wonderful uh, presentation uh, about your work, and I'm, I'm. I think I'll keep myself updated with with both of your works, which is um, amazing. And I would like to see even more um, out there in many different venues, in in ways of diversifying the way we speak about certain moments in history. Thank you to the audience uh, for attending the talk today, for taking the time to come and for everyone who asked their questions. Um, okay, let's, let's wrap up and uh, hopefully see some of you in the next panel on transnational art and cultural di diplomacy. Thank you everyone.